Thursday morning. I'm Pixie. I'm Sen. And I'm Pyrosim. Tonight, enormous news. Like earth-shaking news. News you would not believe if you didn't hear it from us. The sun has in fact stopped burning, and there is no more light in the sky. The world will be cold and dead. And or, Disney has bought Lucasfilm, and immediately announced the creation of Star Wars Episode Seven to be in theaters in 2015. You, you know, like an intelligent company would do with that franchise. Of course. It's like, well, I almost admire the gusto of Disney announcing Star Wars Episode Seven right alongside announcing the acquisition, because it doesn't even pretend that, oh, the reason we wanted to make this movie is because we thought we had a good story to tell. It is like, we think there's a lot of money to be made here, and we want our $4 billion back. Which is the this absolute is how we're gonna get honest our $4 billion truth. Back. Like, there, there really yeah, is nothing totally else to legit. that. Star Wars, it prints money. Sure does. And as a lot of people have said, what is the worst case scenario here? We're going to get a bad Star Wars movie? Well, great. We've like, gotten those for like the past two decades. It'll be fine. <laughs> heaven forbid. Right? We haven't had three of them. <laughs> Four of them, I guess, depending on how sympathetic you are to Return of the Jedi. Hey, I actually I really, really liked the Clone Wars movie that they did. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Clone Wars. Clone Wars tends to stand above the Star Wars rabble. It's no holiday special, for sure. Right. It's nowhere near that bad, but, like, simply put, this is only a good thing. Like, if Disney knows one thing, it's how to successfully milk a franchise. There's also a lot of good stories that already exist after the events of Return of the Jedi in the Star Wars universe. Right, and, and all they have to do, the only thing they have to do, is successfully tell those already existing, already fan-loved stories. You honestly can't say that Disney purchasing Marvel has not been a good thing. Hey, look, they, s Marvel? they suddenly have the budget to do the biggest, most successful superhero movie of all time. Okay. Not untrue. Not not and seeing the bad part of this. Like, every... They do not have to write a new screenplay in order to make a good Star Wars Episode Seven. Nope. I was initially championing, championing that they should make Episode Seven center around Grand Admiral Thrawn, the duology of books by Timothy Zahn, who is the heir to the Empire. I don't know, I, I have Zen. a feeling they're gonna want to run with specifically plot lines that focus on the characters you already know. Like, so I'm willing to bet they're going to try to do something along the lines of, hey, here's all those characters you like. Here's Luke and here's Han. I don't know who on earth they're going to get to play these characters. I'm I'm hoping, I'm really, really hoping that they will go find a new trilogy and just work uh, off oh, of all new characters. Yeah, that is something that I must say immediately. There is no chance that Episode 7 does not have an attached Episode 8 and 9. Right, no, they've Guaranteed already said it. They, they want to do a new exist. trilogy. I didn't see that in the news anywhere, but I could just assume. But, but like, the issue of Episodes 1 through 6 is, hey, this is the full story of of Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader. Once episode 6 ends with Anakin's death, that's it. We told the complete story of his life. You know, from stupid kid found on a desert planet to, you know, evil overlord enforcer of a galactic empire to, oh, I guess he's okay, and then he's dead. Old man with breathing problems. Like, yeah, the, the whole thing, despite being told from Luke's perspective, it was all about Vader. So... You really can't go on with that kind of plot line for another trilogy. Kind of. The other way you could frame it, if you wanted to frame it that way, is that it the Emperor is another through line. The Emperor is there right at the beginning of number one and right at the end of number six. Yep. And your proposed story to adapt was the Dark Empire comic book. Oh yeah, the, the Dark Empire series in which Luke actually infiltrates the Empire as a Sith twice. And Palpatine, despite being dead, 
is around in the form of lots of clones. Yeah, Palpatine was just, like, apparently totally prepared for this the whole time. Just like, yeah, I've got an entire, like, army of clones just ready to go. It'll be fine. I don't know. I don't understand people getting angry about Disney getting their hands on Star Wars. Because Disney knows how to do this kind of thing. Disney's not going to want to be like, yay, we've got Star Wars, let's run it into the ground. Disney's going to be like... Your argument that they own Marvel Studios is the most compelling one I've heard. Yeah, it's how do we make this as successful both financially and from a continued survivability of the franchise standpoint. Because if they just run it into the ground, okay, so they milked three movies out of it that everyone hates and now no one wants to deal with Star Wars anymore. One of the more interesting things about this is that George Lucas is going to not be personally involved in the development of future Star Wars nope, properties. he's completely hands-off from now on. He has no final I say. I think that's a good thing. Yeah, I, I don't... I hate having to disrespect Lucas like this, because he made something really, really great. But it's almost like, yeah, you got lucky with this, and you're almost bitter towards it at this point. Like, it, the argument can be made that George Lucas freaking hates Star Wars and its fans. Because they dominated the majority of his life. I kind of don't blame him for that. And also, I don't think that he can do the series much good in a creative role. No, give, giving mean, it to other people who have new ideas and new stories they want to tell, like, it's pretty much confirmed that the non-Lucas-oriented, uh, Lucas-centered Star Wars productions have been some of the better uh, examples of material that have come out of that series. For example, the Clone Wars. And, in fact, the Clone Wars cartoons. Yep, utterly fantastic. Just people telling great stories in that universe. The Bioware-produced MMO, which, you know, it has been noted on the show that we were all fans of. Yep, it's good, and I, in fact, intend to be playing a lot more of it as soon as it becomes right. free, and I'm not buried under school it, It's eight but... separate incredible stories that just happen to be told in this universe. So I'm interested in the idea that Episode 7, by virtue of it being number seven, and I have no other evidence to support this assertion, will take place after episode six in universe. We would assume so. And, like, the big money Star Wars has never gone after Return of the Jedi. There is so much fiction after Return of the Jedi, but it is all paperback novels yep. that you can get in a used bookstore for a dime for a dozen. Paperback novels and comic books and video games. Like, there are so many extra stories told in the Star Wars universe that never made it to film that the amount of information that they can tap is literally limitless. While those stories don't have much money behind them, I feel like they have some of the best storytelling that exists in that universe. Right. So, my most burning question is simply, what are you adapting? And... There's a few answers you can give me that make me smack you in the face, Disney. You're going to smack the entirety of Disney in the face? I, I'm going to go get Walt Disney out of his cryostasis, and then punch him in the face for this, and then punch him in the face three more times for being a racist, racist person. What I really don't want to see is them just going, huh... So there's a lot of expanded universe out there. You know, we're just going to ignore it and redefine it entirely. Like, I don't want to see them ignore the, the canon. worst case scenario. And I don't think they're going to do that, because they would realize just how many fans of this established universe they would be infuriating. It, it really would have been like them getting their hands on Marvel and just going, yeah, we're just going to rewrite all your plots and forget your canon, and, and hey, can you put Mickey Mouse into this X-Men comic? Like, that would have been the level of what they would have done. And Disney knows that doing that kind of thing is just going to piss off fans and ruin, utterly ruin your chances of making this a financially successful franchise. I wish that I was as confident as you. Like, I think you're right that Disney Pictures has some smart minds running it, and obviously becoming uh, contradictory to expanded universe lore would be an idiotic move. But there's a slightly lighter weight version of that bad decision that I'm afraid of, 
which is that we are going to write an original screenplay in the Expanded Universe timeline that doesn't contradict existing works, but doesn't adapt them either. And, like, that is something they could do, and it's even something that could work if they have a great screenwriter. But it's not the right choice. You know what? Because... I, I'm gonna say this about Disney Pictures. They took a two-minute on-rails boat ride and turned it into one of the best films of the 2000s. Admitted... I can't say that's a, not admitted true. Admitted the sequels were not that, that great. But the original idea that, yeah, we, we took this concept and we ran with it and we made something absolutely incredible out of, like, what could be described as fluff. They totally did. I really okay, think... Okay, Disney Pictures is flawless. No. Disney Pictures but, is is Pixar in the Incredibles it, era. They are... It is really possible for them to screw this up. But I think they're going to handle it well enough that whatever criticisms they receive initially, they will respond to that appropriately. When you argue that worst case scenario, worst possible case scenario, it's a repeat of The Phantom Menace. And best case scenario, it is Pirates of the Caribbean or The Avengers, then I don't see any way to lose here. Right. This is just spectacular. We're used to dealing with subpar disappointing Star Wars at this point. We've done that. If we get more of it, I think the majority of people in the world are just going to shrug their shoulder and be like, huh... Great. Yeah, I mean, it's not like they can make it any worse, really. Right. It it might just be the final proof that, you know what? Star Wars doesn't translate to film as well as we thought it did, and it's just possible that that first trilogy was pure, blind, stupid luck. I, I love the sentence, Star Wars does not translate to film very well, because, yes, I love Star Wars. I love Star Wars deeply. And I am not sure that it's the films that any did it. <laughs> significant proportion of my love for Star Wars is related to film. Right. I think I think a lot of people's deep love for Star Wars is actually the lore and the expanded universe that they love so much. I don't think it's like I Return of the Jedi is a thing. Like it's the worst of the original trilogy. It's an okay movie but it's nowhere near as good as a lot of the expanded universe and a lot of the fluff and the possibility exactly. that was laid out by that first movie. Like, let's face it, the majority of the alien species that exist in the Star Wars universe that are absolutely loved barely appeared in any of the films if they appeared at all. I'm sorry, no one likes the stupid Toydarian thing. No, not anybody. Then, go ahead and bring up midi-chlorians with anybody. I mean, even George Lucas at this point. There, there is nobody that the word midi-chlorians gets a positive reaction Okay, I know of. people who will start fistfights over that word. <laughs> even, even people who don't speak English, they'll just hear the syllables and they'll be upset. At this point, I want to see someone who, like, has barely comprehensible English, like, get angry at the concept of midi-chlorians. I bet you could find one. Your galactic mysterious force? Yeah, it's a blood parasite. Grats. So, I want to advocate just a personal vendetta for what story I think they should adapt. I will say, Timothy Zahn's Heir to the Empire is the totally obvious path, and Dark Empire is a good substitute. But, in the X-Wing series of novels, there is a villain named Yasan Izzard, who is the director of intelligence for the Empire during the war, and she runs... This crazy, like, super intellectual false flag operation against the Republic as it is trying to take Coruscant and establish a legitimate government. And particularly, there's a novel, The Kratos Trap, where she kind of starts a false plague among the Coruscant population and also a Bacta shortage so that the Republic government cannot treat the plague very well. And so she's just going around being this super manipulative imperial loyalist who is just destabilizing the Republic even though the Empire doesn't exist to be loyal to anymore. And that is what I think would be the best possible adaptation or the best possible continuation of this. 
Um, the thing that I doubly like about this, and this might sound a little crazy, is that if you spend episode 7 and maybe 8 and 9 having the Republic build a new galactic government, then you are in perfect shape for the Yuzin Vong to come around in episode 10 and start murdering everybody. So, this would of course mean a fourth trilogy. But, you know, why not? Four Star Wars trilogies. Let's a do it. A trilogy told in nine parts. <laughs> well, they're just making a trilogy of trilogies. Uh, I, I guess actually that's what this is. This is the meta. third trilogy. Now I kind of feel bad about wanting to break three trilogies with four trilogies. It's a quadrilogy of trilogies. Yeah, I... I really think what we'll end up getting is an amalgamation of the extended universe plots. Okay, well, what they need to do is tell every expanded universe novel in parallel, according to the in-universe internal chronology, and just cut between a whole bunch of different stories simultaneously and expect you to keep up with all of these totally separate things. Why, Pyro, wherever would they find an example of how to do this? In, perhaps, the Wachowski's new movie, Cloud Atlas, which is an adaptation of the much-beloved novel of the same name, which follows the conceit of, it tells six different stories by way of, in the first half of the book, it tells the first half of each of these stories, and when it reaches the midway point, of each story, it cuts off wherever it is, and that can be mid-sentence, and that can be even in the middle of a word, and then it transitions to another story. And then, at the midpoint of the entire novel, it hits Act 2, and then it starts telling the second half of each story that was started in the first half. And so, this is obviously a pretty intellectual-seeming novel, and... There had been talks in Hollywood about adapting it forever because of its popularity, but everybody said it was impossible because its its storytelling conceit is so crazy. But then, the Wachowskis have basically just done it. Like, they didn't follow the structure of the book strictly, which is to say that it doesn't tell each story one at a time until a midway point. It just kind of continuously cuts between all of them. But it works. They just tell six stories at the same time. and Using they primarily have the same actors. Them. Right. Using almost exclusively every actor shows up in every story. There's like very minor exceptions, but they work pretty much everybody in at every point. Right. And, and, and it leads to some interesting things, like at some points Hugo Weaving as a female character, um, Halle Berry as a white character. Like, they... And I they... believe Halle Berry actually portrays a male character at one point, too. Yeah. So, the idea of the novel, it, it talks about karma and reincarnation a lot, and that shows up in the movie, too. And so, each character is perhaps representing an archetype of human nature, and so each actor is somewhat similar to the other versions of themselves in terms of their ideologies and behaviors. And it's sort of like a boundary-breaking idea insofar as, yes, this archetype of human behavior is not associated with being black or being female or any other outward characteristic, but we will make each of these archetypes portrayed by this actor exist in a number of cultures um, with a number of external appearances. And the makeup in this movie is kind of amazing. Like, um, there's some arguments that it falls apart in the Neo Soul uh, storyline, and that some of the makeup is, like, maybe offensively bad. People have called it racist. I don't think that's true, especially given the rather universalist themes of the work. But in most cases, the makeup is so good that you will find yourself saying when the credits roll, and there's a montage, of course, after the movie ends, of all these characters were played by these actors. And you're like, 
Oh, that character was played by Hugo Weaving? I'm amazed that I didn't recognize that. So, astounding makeup, um, astounding music. Um, one of the storylines is about a composer slash musician, and they spend a lot of time talking about music as a result of that, and then there's sort of a meta idea that the way the whole movie works is fairly musical. The, each story is a bit of a motif, and the whole movie is a bolero, and the, they just weave the motifs back and forth into a climax at the end. It also references the book a lot. Like, the book Cloud Atlas itself exists in the composer storyline, and the composer only has the first half of it, and he's writing in his journal complaining that he can't find the second half, and that it is a huge letdown to only be able to read all of these stories up to their midway point. So each individual story isn't terribly complicated, and that is pretty important because if they were trying to tell you six terribly complicated stories at the same time, you would get confused, but it's got the appeal of, say, playing League of Legends, insofar as you have to be constantly engaged with this movie. You cannot look away, you cannot blink, or you're going to miss a lot of stuff. And maybe that's a problem, seeing as it's two hours and 44 minutes long. You may want to prepare your bladder for this movie. But just so much stuff is happening constantly that this movie is amazing to watch. Um, I won't get into a lot of spoilers, obviously, because... Well, first of all, I think everybody needs to see this movie. There's not Just quite don't anything do it else while you have to that pee. works. <laughs> yes, okay. Be sure not to drink drinks for maybe two hours before you go to see Cloud Atlas. Prepare for it like you were going for a blood test. <laughs> there is a lot of moments in Cloud Atlas that are super intense. Like, I found myself standing up and being like, Did that just happen? I was, of course, sitting in the back of the theater, and not that anybody else was there to be obstructed by me. For some reason, this movie is only being shown on one screen in my town with three movie theaters, despite being directed by the directors of The Matrix and producers of V for Vendetta. Really? I've, I and, think I've got it on, like, four theaters in town. Nope, it's on one screen. and So that, that amounts to, at two hours and 44 minutes... Three showtimes. It is, like, dire in my city. It looks like it's not even going to be available to see in theaters pretty soon. All right. And the crowd in this movie was not very large. Well, incidentally, I happened to totally coincidentally run into some pals of mine who were also going to see it. I was like, oh, the smart people with good taste are the ones coming to this movie. It maybe doesn't have the mass appeal of a Michael Bay movie. But I actually want to compare it to Shakespeare, and the reason I want to do that is not because of it being smart, but because of it being dumb. If you take a class on Shakespeare, what they'll teach you often is that Shakespeare was a crowd pleaser back in the day. And modern audiences don't see that very much, because a lot of the puns don't carry through to modern language. But original Shakespeare, back when it was being performed was kind of a bawdy, jokey, violent crowd-pleaser. And the smart stuff just existed in the background. And that is a bit of the way Cloud Atlas works. There is, There are puns in this movie. There are Soylent Green references. Insofar as it is an old guy escaping from an old folks' home. Being like, Soylent Green is people because he thinks this old folks' home is a nasty place. And it's it's a funny movie. It's got tons of mass appeal in all kinds of ways that you wouldn't expect from its crazy storytelling conceit. But at the same time, it's got this uh, philosophical through line about human nature, how humans, despite whatever technological situation they may be in, the stories span from... uh. I guess you'd call it Victorian area, not really pre-technology, 
but up to post-apocalyptic pre-technology. So, it, it portrays humans in all states of technology, but draws the conclusion that human behavior is pretty much the same regardless. And actually kind of has the dumb, soppy, romantic message of be nice to people and it'll work out well for you. Evil exists and good people have to fight against it and that's how the world works. Uh, that is the the smart part of Cloud Atlas is it's got that romantic message deeply embedded in it and told using the tools of motif and metaphor and parallels between all these different stories. And, okay, even the smart part of it doesn't seem that smart when I put it that way, but this movie is told in a way that other movies are not told. It's, it's totally different from anything I've ever seen, and if you go see it totally different than I'm sure anything you'll have ever seen, I don't think it's anything that will be repeated. As much as I respect Disney Pictures for the Marvel Pictures, <laughs> this is not going to happen again, either from them or from anybody else. Um, I think this is a movie that will go down in best movies ever list. Like, I don't actually think it's that good, but I think that if you're a student of cinema, it will be very important for you to see. Yeah, there... And it's it's just a fun movie. There, there's definitely the claim that, yeah, people don't really stand a chance at the Oscars this year. Like, it, it's kind of done. This is going to have best uh, picture, best makeup. It's possible. Uh, the The Academy has traditionally been a bit of snobs, and they try and give the movie, or the give the Oscars to movies that don't succeed in the box office. And depending on how Cloud Atlas does at the box office, that may qualify them just fine for an Oscar. Well, that ball is still up in the air. But it deserves Oscars. And it deserves your eyes, because... I was talking about Argo last week, and I said that Argo is pretty good as thrillers go. And so if you want to see a good thriller, you should see Argo. Um, Cloud Atlas is not like any other movie that has been made so far. And so, if you want to see a movie that is totally different from anything you've ever seen, but still has puns and action choreography and amazing visuals in it, you should see Cloud Atlas is to say that if you have a brain in your head, you should see Cloud Atlas. <laughs> so speaking of movies that require a little less intelligence, um, we actually have a couple coming out this week that seem to be kind of interesting. Um, first up on the list, uh, one that I know we're all looking forward to, Wreck-It Ralph is uh, due out this Friday, November 2nd. The Who Framed Roger Rabbit of the video game era. Which woo? Getting all the big characters together. Yeah, dis despite the fact that I am not a fan of Sarah Silverman at all, I, I will go on record as saying, yeah. Um, I'm really looking forward to this movie. I think it's going to be really interesting. It seems to have a cool plot behind it, great scenes, great direction. Like, I want to see this. I think this is... Wreck-It Ralph is going to be a movie that destroys at the box office and then has a lingering cultural impact. Actually, I've had this thought in my head for a long time that... Avatar did really good at the box office, and it had a cultural impact for, like, five minutes <laughs> in society terms. That's not right. And now everybody has forgotten about Avatar. Everyone kind you of made about... the, the dances with Smurfs joke and then moved on. Yeah. You think about James Cameron and Titanic. Like, Titanic is still part of the cultural consciousness. People think about Titanic, and I think people don't think about Avatar anymore. It's totally forgotten. I don't think Wreck-It Ralph is going to go that way. I think Wreck-It Ralph is going to stick around, and people are going to be referencing it forever. I'm saying that, of course, without having seen it yet, but it's just tying so many famous properties together. Nobody is going to forget a scene where the ghost from Pac-Man and Bowser are in the same shot, interacting with each other. Also, Bison? It's... Also, M. Bison. And, well, I mean, we all know how I feel about this, because it's a well-known fact that Who Framed Roger Rabbit is my favorite movie, so... <laughs> Do it. Who Framed Roger Rabbit is pretty amazing. Doing that in video games, which I also love, is... Just shut up and take my money. 
So yeah, uh, also coming out this uh, Friday, Riz's The Man with the Iron Fists. Every time I see the trailer for that, like, for the first 30 seconds of the trailer, I am curious and interested, and then I see the rest of the trailer, and I am not curious, and I am not interested. Okay, here here's the reason that I'm talking about this. I'm interested in it in the... The way of, hey, you know what was really cool? Kill Bill. Why don't we make Kill Bill where no one gives a crap? And we'll see what happens. Uh, like, uh, yeah, I, I see it, that. It's let's take the really cool fight scenes from Kill Bill and just play around with it. I'm not sure that if you, you can get away with being Quentin Tarantino without being Quentin Tarantino. Well, he's producing though. it. And, like, it's being written and directed by Rizzo, who's also starring in it, which that's always a bad sign. I'm sorry, when you star in the movie you direct, yeah, that that's questionable. Um, but it's also got Eli Roth behind it for basically the gore factor. You know, this is the guy behind Hostel. I didn't actually know that Quentin Tarantino was attached to Iron Fist. Yeah, he's the, one of the producers. Well, that <laughs> sort of... That gives me the only hope I have ever had for that movie. Because, I mean, no disrespect to Wu-Tang, but... RZA? <laughs> RZA. RZA? <laughs> well, ben Affleck did okay by directing his own movie that he's starring in in Argo, but... Right, uh, but he's I, Ben I, Affleck. I think you're right that Ben Affleck... But he's Ben Affleck. And the other right, guy is exactly RZA. I needed to finish that sentence. RZA. RZA. Yep. RZA. It's about all you can say there. So, the idea... I want to put forth the idea that the Wachowski is shadow-directed V for Vendetta from the producer role. The... Um, and likewise, this nominal. isn't the first time Quentin Tarantino has put his name on something because he liked the idea of it. No. And so, if he is attached to Iron Fist as the producer role, maybe he can pull this movie back... Um, the third Matrix movie, and I would argue not even the second, destroyed the Wachowskis' reputation forever. Uh, nobody takes them seriously, and I think they're going to come right back from that once Cloud Atlas hits its stride. But the thing that the Wachowskis have never failed in is visuals. Every movie they have made, from Speed Racer to the third Matrix movie, all looked great. And V for Vendetta looks like a Wachowski's movie. It's got... When the throwing knives look like bullets while they're in the air, that is a conceit that came from the same minds that did the pressure waves and the dodging the bullets in slow motion. Mm -hmm. So, on other f movie news, uh, we actually have confirmation regarding the next X-Men First Class sequel which will be coming out in 2014. Uh, they have confirmed the working title will be X-Men Days of Future Past, which, if you're an X-Men fan, actually means a big deal. Yes, that is an important comic. Yep. Dude. So I, this I'm means we could be this. seeing Bishop for the first time since, you know, the 90s. <laughs> um, Can we just yeah, not go like, there? Th this is a really cool plot line. Like, I, I absolutely love the concept of the Days of Future Past. You know, we get we get Kitty Pride, which was badly represented in the third film. <laughs> Terribly represented. Right? Like, there there could be a lot of interesting things here. And it still Although has I'm Brian back Singer. Pixie up with respect to Bishop. <laughs> We're still just not acknowledging Cable or Bishop? Nope. Not just happening. No. We'll go ahead and do a selective adaptation of this and keep the parts that are good. And and I'm willing to bet that's what the they'll be doing, that because good. that's exactly what they did with First Class. It's like, huh, there are lots of things in this comic that are actually really, really cool, but a lot of things that are terrible. Uh, yeah, why don't we just pick and choose? We'll work from there. The director of X-Men First Class was attached to this movie until, like, two weeks ago when he bailed without much context to become the um, side Marvel Universe director at Fox. So, 
This was going to be directed by the X-Men First Class director, and he was part Matthew of Vaughan. a lot of the pre-production. Yeah, Matthew Vaughn, thank you. But he is not going to actually be the total director of this. Right, my... Which is a little distressing. Do we have a new director attached Yeah, Brian to Singer. Okay. Um, um, the gentleman responsible for the previous uh, Superman film. Superman Returns. Yep. I never saw that movie. Yeah. It had baby Superman in it. <laughs> Did you see yeah, it? Yeah, I've seen it. Had a uh, Is it terrible? Kevin Spacey as Lex Luthor. It's pretty bad. <laughs> I, I I believe you when you say that it's it, It's a red belt cinema at its best. Like my it's one of those movies that you just you watch it for the spectacle of how did they mess this up? Okay, well, I'm looking. Brian Singer is attached to X Men 2000 and X2. Yep, but not to X3. No, he ran away from so, that. He the, ran. Okay, screaming. you get a thumbs up as long as you're not attached to X3. Well, the problem is he actually went and made Superman Returns. Well, I don't know. X Men 2000 was pretty good. So yeah, I I will give. Brian Singer the 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 pass as I will go see Days of Future Past when it comes out. Like I was a big enough fan of X Men First Class. Like I I was so surprised by how much I liked that movie that it, it completely redeemed X Three from having existed. Yeah, it's it's hard to say anything about the Fox Pictures X Men right now because on one hand we had X Three and then we had X Men Origins Wolverine. And those were atrocities, but then they did turn it around with X Men First Class. So we're three and two right now. Yep. So I guess. So there is a sixty percent chance that this will be good, and a forty percent chance this will be terrible. I'll have to go see and find out. I, I don't know. I'm. I don't have an opportunity to. I'm having flashbacks of the absolutely terrible CG effects of Wolverine slicing a sink in half with, you know, obviously CG'd claws. Oh, X Men Origins Wolverine! You were po perhaps you one were of the, the worst movie movies ever. Could not even be redeemed by me just staring at Hugh Jackman for ninety minutes, dude. Not even that could save you. They messed up Deadpool. They you se messed up. They messed up Deadpool perhaps so severely that I don't even know who could have done right. that. Perhaps it one of the easiest Marvel characters not... in existence, and you screwed him up. The only way that anybody could have done that is if they had no idea who Deadpool was, or, and they pulled a name out right. of a hat, and nothing else. And just didn't just care. Name. They didn't realize that Deadpool is this interesting and huge character. Just slapped the name on this screenplay as a bit of flavor. Right. This is why, frankly, I'm hoping that when the inevitable Deadpool movie gets made, they just forget about Ryan Reynolds, and they're just like, we're gonna just keep you in the suit the entire movie, and have the voice actor who's doing your game just do all your lines. That is oh. the ideal way to do Deadpool. My soul has hurt for a while about the Marvel license being split between Fox and Disney, but now that I realize, truly realize, that Deadpool is on the Fox license, my soul hurts. Right. He's unfortunately... In the form of physical pain in my torso. He's put up as part of the mutant roster, and so he is at Fox. Get Deadpool to Disney. <laughs> get Deadpool to Marvel Pictures. This sounds like a crusade. let magic happen. Let magic happen. We as a society, as human beings, need to fix this injustice. <laughs> I just want the Fantastic Four to be at uh, back in Marvel Disney's hands so that they can well, add them to the Avengers uh, films. Cause I liked X-Men 2000. I liked X-Men First Class. I liked both of those movies a lot. Every Marvel property that Fox has licensed to should revert to Disney immediately. Just give it back. We've seen what they can do. I, I'm sure they would get Brian Singer back on. They would get Matthew Vaughn back on. Disney's that smart. They, they've got the majority of their franchises at the moment. Unfortunately, they can't get Spider-Man back for another uh, five years now, which Sony has already announced that there are two more sequels to The Amazing Spider-Man in the works. With the same lead actor, but 
no other associated staff. Yep. Like a different screenwriter, a different pursu- producer, a different director. Yeah. The entire meta crew for that movie. Sony is just got rushing fired. to not lose the license to this thing. They're like, there's money here, we can't lose it. You know, it you would think Marvel would have put in something where it's like, yeah, if you make a film every five years, you retain the rights to it. Up to a point. Yeah. At some point, we just get it back. I almost want a meta movie about the interaction between Marvel and Disney and Fox. And maybe, okay, I actually now want a serious documentary about comic book movies. Because that contract with Fox sounds like a deal you would make with a genie. This sounds like a morality tale in ancient Greece. And a hamartia has been committed by writing this vague contract. It is, it's just a horror movie from there. Right. You, it, admittedly, there there is... Right now, let me, let me double check this. But I don't believe there is a Fantastic Four movie in the works right now. Which means that the contract is going to default back. I have forgotten... So I'll need one of you two to tell me. Are the Fantastic Four interesting characters? <laughs> yeah. I, I don't even know. I, I don't even know at this I point. Have, I, don't I know. actually really love the Fantastic Four characters. Like, I think the f- them being the family of the Marvel Universe mm-hmm. is interesting. And actually, the kids are the most interesting parts of the comic. Like, hmm, these are two children growing up with incredibly dangerous situations thrown at them, like, daily, who are just... F- trying to figure out how to uh, use their powers and be kids. All right, I'm sold. You sold me. It didn't take much. I, w- I want awesome Fantastic Four movies. Also, you know, Reed and Sue are just super cute together. And Reed and Sue are super cute together. And at each other's throats constantly, because Reed is cute. kind of a screw-up. <laughs> but, like, there's mm. so much interesting dynamics in the Fantastic Four. Like, the Ultimate Fantastic Four comics were by far... My favorite run of the Ultimate line. I mean, that's actually where the uh, the Marvel Zombie Universe came from, from a, an Ultimate Fantastic Four storyline. I can't recommend those books highly enough. At this moment, I wish we were not on FCC airwaves because suddenly I want a movie involving Reed and Sue, and it is not a superhero movie. <laughs> it's not an action movie. Well, not that kind of action. It would not get a Reed, it would Reed and not Sue's get domestic a encounter rating. Likewise, how Mr. Fantastic deals with the police. This is that, this is becoming that, dangerous. I want territory. to see that movie. Yep, I want to see that movie. No, but there, there's actually a really amazing take on the Fantastic Four that Marvel did for the Marvel Knights series, where basically they uh, they were uh, cheated by one of their lawyers and ended up losing everything, all of their money, the tower, all of it. They lost everything. And ended up just having to go live in this little apartment in the middle of the city with Reed doing consulting jobs for money. That sounds pretty interesting. And that was actually one of the most interesting stories done with them. Like, they I would they are at their that... absolute most boring when they're being superheroes. Which is right. really saying something. Uh-huh. I would argue that The Incredibles is the single best Pixar movie, and one of the things that is most interesting about it is that it is this totally domestic family movie. It is I Love Lucy with superheroes, and yeah, they save the world, but that's not the interesting part of it. It is the family dynamic between these characters that powers Pixar's The Incredibles. And telling non-superhero stories with superheroes is something that has not been done enough. Oh, I... I would love to see the Fantastic Four go back to being a part of Marvel's group of characters, because I guarantee you if Marvel got their hands on the Fantastic Four again, there would be an instant reboot launched. Like, I'm sorry, Chris Evans, you were a terrible Johnny Storm. You are a great Captain America. Oh, I can't I can't hold anything ab- against Chris Evans nowadays. Chris Evans is so handsome. <laughs> He's Captain America. You get away with anything in my heart. I don't know. It's been a long time since I've seen any of the Fantastic Four movies. Chris so Evans, your character's maybe still I'd be freaking a different boring. Tune if I did, but I'm sorry, Captain is the most boring of all of those characters. I can't even say he's the most handsome because that wouldn't be true. But he is—he is handsome. 
I don't know. So yeah, there, way to go, Cap. There is. I liked the scene where Thor hit your shield. That was the cool. the one thing I truly hope Marvel never gets the chance to do. I don't want a Marvel Zombies movie ever. Just let let's forget that that happened and just write it up as yeah. During the uh, the late two thousands, everything had to have zombies in it at some point. So do you not like the Marvel Zombies storyline in the comics? At all? I like, or do you just not want it? Adapted? I liked the introduction of it as part of the Ultimate Fantastic Four. I thought that was really great and really creative and really cool. But then when you have four four miniseries based on just yeah, it's it's Marvel and their <laughs> zombies. Like, hmm. Well, let's squeeze this concept just a little bit harder, and maybe a drop of money will come out. Okay, I agree with you one hundred percent on that account, but. Your concern about Marvel Zombies is the same problem that is true of every comic book event in actual comics ever, which is that it was great at the start, and then they kept doing it forever. That is... that is how any event... But, any event. But if anything, the most recent Avengers vs. X-Men event actually shows what events are supposed to be. These are things that fundamentally change the way that this uh, world works. They leave the comic book universe as something different than it was before. And hopefully, something that won't be just retconned a few uh, months down the road. Like, that's the worst way sure. to do an event. Right. Okay, I want to argue that um, I actually would like to see an adaptation of Marvel Zombies... And I think that movies have a natural, I won't say immunity, but resistance to that sort of event fatigue insofar as it's not new issues every month. That is one of the ways that comics can get themselves into trouble, is that when they're printing a new issue every month and you do the same thing over and over again, you do it a lot more. Whereas even if a movie is doing the same thing over and over again, they're doing it once a year, once every two years. Um, the Fantastic Four is... I want to see a Marvel Zombies movie that involves all of the Marvel um, Universe characters, but is a single movie, one and done. You've handled the zombies, that's it. I just have no... I just have no interest in the Marvel Zombies property. Like, I thought it was kind of interesting um, in... I don't remember which book of yours it was I borrowed that uh, featured zombie Reed Richards being all like wahaha and evil. It was probably the ultimate. That's probably it was probably the, the ultimate Fantastic Four. But um, that one was kind of interesting, but mostly in that it put him in a villain role and not particularly because of the zombies thing. Like, the zombies feels like a cheap gimmick to me, and right having I, an evil Reed Richards that's a big deal. Yeah, him being like, a zombie, that was just kind of on top of it. That was that was just kind of like the loose reasoning for it. And I feel right. like that could have been done better. Yeah. But I will tell you, the, the, the one thing that could really, really push the Avengers 3 over the top for me is if they did the Civil War plotline. If we had enough characters in the expanded Marvel movie universe well, that they could actually do Civil War, oh my god. 1602? Okay. 1602. Pixie got right my there. there. Nah. I, I don't think they would ever actually do no, 1602. I, I don't think they ever would, but it would be awesome. <laughs> it, it I'm would be afraid cool. of I like the Civil that. War because I don't know that the Civil War is bright and shiny and fun. No, the Civil like, War is not fun. But then again, I think they're getting away from that in the movies in general. If you've seen the trailer for the third uh, upcoming Iron Man movie, they're not going to be uh, bright and fun anymore. The trailer doesn't advertise it as being fun. Um, People who have read the screenplay say that the screenplay is funny. Uh, insider sources say that, and I want Iron Man to continue to be funny and fun, even if they do Demon in a Bottle. I want that movie, because, okay, Demon in a Bottle, you can have a comic that is not fun, because a comic is not long, but I don't want Disney Marvel to be Christopher Nolan Batman. I love Christopher Nolan Batman, but comics 
are a medium that have a lot of potential for fun, and that has worked out amazingly in Iron Man 1, Iron Man 2, The Avengers, Thor, Captain America. They're all fun movies. Yeah, Rob, Robert Downey Jr.'s hilarious. Tony Stark is definitely the comic relief of that team. Even though the original Tony Stark really isn't that kind of character, Jr.'s work just works better. His version of Tony Stark is more appealing than the comic book sure. version. And it's a natural fit that he would be the fun and funny character because he's a playboy, and he was always a playboy. Right. No, to Tony Stark so, has just been run as a more and more serious character throughout the comics, and it was really his his uh, reinvention by Matt Fraction that kind of changed things. And I would argue for the better. Yeah, without a doubt. I guess my decision about um the civil war depends on where iron man 3 goes and how good iron man 3 is because if iron man 3 is dark and bad i don't want civil war if iron man 3 is fun and good i don't want civil war if iron man 3 is a christopher nolan batman movie then i guess thumbs up on civil war but i don't i don't think that's going to happen Right, it it definitely won't be the next Avengers movie. Like, the next Avengers movie, without a doubt, is going to be, hey look, Thanos, oh dear. Okay, now, just sign me up for that, I'll take it. Yeah, we, we've already been shown that in the ending of the last one, that, hey, this is coming. What I'd actually like to see is them to do kind of an Ultimates version of Galactus, but I have a feeling we're not going to get that. They don't have the license for Galactus. Yeah, that, that unfortunately goes with the Fantastic Four. Well, I feel like this episode we have earned our nerd stripes by talking about comics a lot. Yep. And the inside baseball about comics. Yeah, I think we're done what here. What a bunch of nerds. Cave Johnson, So we're done here. I've earned my cookie for the day, and I'm so, you know, leaving. Goodbye. Have fun. This has been Nerd Talk. <laughs> what? Alright, so next week is... Stuff. Uh, more specifically, um... More League of Legends than you can deal with. Pyro probably gonna be Assassin's Creed. I will not be able to talk about Assassin's Creed because it won't be out on PC. It's out for consoles, but I won't be able to play it until November 20th. Alright, and in just two short weeks, we're gonna be doing our Tequila DJ raffle. Um, so you should like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash nerdtalk, or follow me on Twitter at nerdtalkpixie. Uh, you should pick up one of our awesome raffle tickets to help Advocate Hope Children's Hospital Family Assistance Fund. They're only $3 each or two for five. And we'll be giving away different prizes every hour on the show. It'll be great. They include Steam keys for a couple of those Assassin's Creed games all the kids are going crazy for. And Blu-rays of the Avenger that we like so much. Indeed. Avengers. Yeah, there, there was more than one of them. Avengers, I mean. Well, at any rate, uh, so if you'd like to have a chance at winning that, you might want to get in touch with me. Uh, you can even shoot me an email if you're so inclined to pixie at nerdtalkshow.com. Uh, in the meantime, we'll see you next week. I'm Pixie. I'm Sam. And I'm Pyrosim. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk. <laughs>